Okay, for those of you who just logged in, welcome to today's program. We're glad to have you here today. Uh, as you may know, uh, during most of our programs, we start a few minutes early just so you can get settled in, uh, make sure your volume is set correctly. And you'll notice on uh, the screen um, right now is a series of slides from CPF um, with some helpful information on today's program as well. So if you um, see captions at the bottom of your screen and you don't want that, you can always click on the hide captions uh, button. If you need closed captioning, you can click that as well uh, by clicking on the uh, show captions button on the bottom. Um, we have uh, an hour and a half program in total today. Uh, the first 60 minutes will be uh, the, today's program on game design and heritage conservation. And then we'll uh, close with 30 minutes for our annual meeting and uh, introduction of new trustees. Um, and uh, we have plenty of time for questions today. So if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to use the Q&A button. Uh, we recommend you use the Q&A button to ask those questions because uh, it's more likely that we'll be able to moderate them. There's also a fe feature there where you can upvote a question. So uh, that way I'll take those questions in the order that you would like to see them answered. Uh, so feel free to click the thumbs up symbol next to the question that you want to see addressed. Uh, you also can use the chat function. I'm going to enable it for everybody right now. So feel free to use that if you'd like to. Um, and today's program will be recorded in full, so if you'd like to access it later, you can always visit our Facebook channel, uh, video channel, or, or hop over to YouTube or LinkedIn where you'll find the recording for today's program. So uh, we look forward to your questions. And um, as a reminder, we have some uh, exciting programs coming up as well in addition to today's program. We have a Secretary of Interior Standards Boot Camp, which starts on July the 27th and runs for a period of three months. It's a three-part series, and it's a great opportunity to really get acquainted with the standards if you're not already, and also dive into some more complex uh, aspects of, of the standards, more advanced uh, aspects, and do more interactive exercises. So we hope you'll join us for that. You can find information on our website at californiapreservation.org. We also have uh, in September, September 9th and 10th, over the weekend, we will be presenting our second annual Doors Open California series of programs. This year we have 71 plus sites and uh, you, you'll have an opportunity to join any of those sites and see, uh, have access to these places, uh, norm which normally isn't available to open to the public for many of these. And also we have a sponsorship package that will soon be released for Doors Open California. So if any of you are interested in sponsoring either the local activities within your community or a statewide doors open sponsor, we would welcome your support and feel free to get in touch with us by uh, emailing cpf at californiapreservation.org if you'd like to learn more about doors open sponsorship. Um, and of course, as always, we appreciate your membership. And if you are not already a member, we would love your support uh, by joining CPF. And you can do that by visiting californiapreservation.org slash join. Uh, we have about two minutes before the start of the program. Feel free to let us know where you are today. Uh, we uh, welcome your questions and we'll see you here uh, starting at 10 a.m. We now are one minute away from the start of the program. So we'll see you in one minute.
standing um, uh, uh, house in Boston. And if you look at this, it seems like it, you know, has all of its 17th century features and could be duplicated exactly in the game. Uh, but it went through many eras, and this is what it looked like in the mid 19th century before um, restoration. So what we're seeing is not something that's persisted the entire time. Um, we also have to think of this game about how to kind of respond to popular myths and legends. Uh, for instance, Paul Revere famously wouldn't have said the British are coming because everybody in this period is a is considered to be a British subject. Uh, unlike the poem, he didn't ride by himself. He, at different stretches, uh, was uh, riding alongside. William Dawes and Samuel Prescott. Um, but there's also some legendary parts of this that we thought were fun additions. Uh, there's a folk tale about uh, Revere sending his dog home to fetch his spurs before he gets on his horse. And so we include that as a playable sequence in the game. Um, one final thing that didn't come up with Black Haven that was a, a factor in this was, was copyright. Um, this game is officially licensed by Woods Estate after uh, a long back and forth, um, and uh, this is a picture of Wood who regularly um, photographed himself uh, next to paintings to try to preserve copyright. Um, although I did make the argument when negotiating that uh, uh, we are closer um, or further from Wood's painting than he was to uh, Longfellow's poem when he wrote. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the last uh, kind of problem that we had to solve was the problem of tone. Um, and this is a tricky thing, even though this is a much lighter game than Blackhaven, uh, how do we depict, you know, the revolutionary era in a, uh, an all ages way without losing sight of the ugly realities of the 18th century? Um, and this is a, a period in a story that makes outright heroes and villains difficult. Um, Revere never owned uh, any enslaved people. We don't have any record of his views on slavery either way. Uh, but a circle contained both um, Samuel Adams, who was uh, a member of a family of early abolitionists, and John Hancock, who um, inherited a number of enslaved servants and benefited from the slave trade in his um, uh, uh, business as an importer. Um, and uh, people in New England still grapple with these ambiguities. Uh, local actor Charlie Price says that he reenacts as Prince Easterbrook, who was an enslaved patriot uh, veteran of Lexington, uh, both because he's very proud of uh, Easterbrook's service, uh, but also because he's shocked how few people know that slavery ever, ever existed in New England, and he uh, wants to, you know, make this part of the story. Um, a sort of regionalist art, including Grant Wood, also uh, has a, a number of similar ambiguities. Um, American Gothic itself is so famous and sometimes called the American Mona Lisa because it's unclear if he is lionizing or making fun of the small town pair. And surely in most of his work, it's a little bit of both. Um, and the regionalist movement is full of contradictions. Wood was a closeted gay man living as a supposedly shy Midwest bachelor. Uh, he rarely dealt with social justice themes and was e even unfairly accused of echoing fascist aesthetics with his apple pie Americana vistas. But his Iowa speaker series uh, called the Society for Pres uh, the Prevention of Cruelty Against Speakers, uh, which was a mock Victorian salon complete with goofy fake mustaches, uh, hosted real activist luminaries, including the poet Langston Hughes and N NAACP president James Weldon Johnson, now known as the um, composer of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Wood's friend uh, Thomas Hart Bitten had similar contradictions. Um, uh, he both received awards from the NAACP for his work on racial justice, but was also a virulent homophobe, even for his time. Um, and yet he relentlessly championed Wood uh, and was at his bedside during his untimely death from cancer at age 50, along with Wood's possible male partner. So I was still uh, considering how, you know, we might incorporate the regionalists, uh, both sympathetic but warts and all depictions of American history. Uh, when I came across an art critic's commentary on Wood's Revere painting, which compared the view to that from a theater balcony. And so that seemed to be a possible solution that instead of trying to depict this directly, we would stage this as a night at the theater. And so the game is presented as a 1930s WPA theater production of a play about Paul Revere, similar to programs that Wood himself oversaw. Um, the stage and curtains now uh, would make natural boundaries for the kind of endless running sections on the treadmill. And now we could have fourth wall breaks with little stage hands running on and fixing scenery and people laughing and applauding and even virtual actors occasionally breaking character. 
And we could also uh, remix um, some other um, elements from kind of regionalist painting, which often satirizes early America. Um, to give you an idea how some of these uh, events came together, I'll just show a, a quick uh, clip here of, this is an early demo of Paul running and you can see on the edges, um, if I click ahead here, uh, you get a little bit of the sense of the stage and the, the curtain. Okay, um, last, uh, although we're still in the middle of the development, I can sp speak a little bit about our plans for impact. Uh, like Black Haven, we've met with stakeholders, including four Freedom Trail sites, uh, like the Paul Revere House and the Old North Church, uh, the latter of which is especially valuable because they've just received some grant funding um, to do work on the contributions of women and African Americans in their historic congregation. Uh, the game will release, hopefully, right before Christmas this fall on MetaQuest, which is formerly Oculus Quest. Um, and other platforms, uh, and we're hoping to both attract just regular uh, game players, but also uh, possible classroom settings. And we've talked about kiosks with some of the historic sites involved. Um, so to finish, I just want to show you a clip of um, how the uh, kind of final uh, version of this looks. Um, this is the painting again, and this is the same But then this is what it looks like in the VR. All right, so that's a lot of different stuff. Uh, be happy when we get to Q&A to answer questions about any aspect of that. And uh, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, James. Um... I uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Juan Hiriart, Hir Hir and um, I'm not sure if Mario's on yet, but uh, feel free to. Oh, he is. Hi, Mario. Nice to yeah, meet you. So we'll jump hey, right everyone. into your. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so. And you see the presentation? Yes. Yeah, we see it. Yes. Oh, um, okay, if you so. if you could click on the uh, more at the top of your screen on the far right, uh, and um, and then hide. Uh, see if you could close that panel on the top. Yep. All right. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yeah, should be should be fine now, right? Okay, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting us, and also to James for that great presentation. Very, definitely very interesting. And uh, my name is Juan Idier, and I am a lecturer at Salford University in Greater Manchester. I'm a game designer, uh, but um, on my research, I've been working with historians, archaeologists, and also communities uh, making games, things from Anglo Saxon history to the Industrial Revolution. And I am very happy to be presenting today with Mario Tuki. Um, Mario is an artist, a Rapa Nui artist, a cultural manager, community researcher, and collections manager at the Rapa Nui Museum. Hi, Mario. Yolana, hello to everyone. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. Excellent. Yeah, so um, Yolana, yeah, Yolana. And in this presentation, we would like to talk about um, this game project uh, developed with the community from Rapa Nui, Easter Island, uh, to preserve intangible cultural heritage. Now, this project is uh, a student project, um, but also an international collaboration between the Rabanui community, uh, Chile, Australia, and the UK. Um, so it has many points as well, interesting to go through, um, especially on the, on the, on the process that, that we have. So just to start, I would like to give uh, a little bit of context about Easter Island. Um, Rapa Nui in, in the language is called uh, Te Pito Atenua. Uh, Mario, please, if I say something wrong, you please immediately can uh, correct me. Um, that translates literally to the belly bottom of the world. So uh, it's a small volcanic island in, 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 in the middle of the Pacific and it's very isolated, distance something like 300 and 500 kilometers from the Chilean coast. Um, it, I would say that it, it uh, identifies itself more with Polynesian cultural, ethnically, uh, ethnic and cultural groups more than Chilean groups. Is that, is that correct, Mario? 
Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So just a, a bit of context there. Um, the colonial history of Rapa Nui is a tale of destruction and dispossession uh, with long lasting effects. Um, prior to the annexation by the Chilean states, the Rapa Nui community suffered from the devastating effects from slave trade and also diseases carried by outsiders, uh, the population diminishing from a native um, 300 or 5,000, 5, sorry, 5,000 uh, 5, uh, people to just 110 survivors. And, and th th those events, of course, led not just um, to the rapid disintegration of uh, the many of the existing patterns of social and cultural organization. And then I can I, I can give uh, Mario um, so you, you can um, tell us a, a little bit more about uh, the, the history in the island. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Juan, for inviting me to this uh, session to participate on this. Um, on this session online. Uh, more than discussing the, the original history of, of Rapa Nui, I want to thank uh, you and the team that works along uh, for addressing to work with the community. Uh, I think this is the most valuable part of, of, of me being present here uh, to share a testimony from the inside of the community uh, because it's, it's something that not always happened and it's always uh, grateful for the community to, to push the barrier of uh, colonization by being part of any project that it's developed on the Rapa Nui context. Uh, well, our history, we, we have a very clear that we have a long 800 to 900 years of uh, development, inner development in Rapa Nui by the, the Polynesian colonizers. But then we have this crossed the history with Europeans when they arrived in 1722 to Rapa Nui, and all our history changed. So we we can divide this uh, ancient period and this uh, contemporary period with that uh, with that date mm -hmm. uh, due to the contact. And I want to jump in into nowadays. Nowadays, Rapa Nui is a place very integrated to the world. We, we mainly base our economy in tourism, but that means that uh, we are connected as we are now in this uh, same uh, meeting. And also the Rapa Nui people are, are in a position that they can, they can write their own history. They can participate in everything. And I want to, to spotlight the, the main objective of this project that is the preservation of the intangible heritage. Because in, in my point of view, the intangible heritage is mainly the, the population, the Rapa Nui remaining population, which I am part of it. All our knowledge that we hold, that it has been inherited from our forefathers, or mothers. And I think uniting this with the technology that uh, the games and and all the technology that can help to improve the preservation of this uh, knowledge and of this heritage is always a big opportunity it's a very ambitious project but also helps a lot for the expression of of the actual community the correct community to to show to share this knowledge but also to to have a tool, produce a tool that can help us ourselves with our children, with our new generations, to, to, to present all this knowledge in a more attractive way. Mm -hmm. As a community that is uh, also open to the world, we have all the work at home also. So it's difficult to compete with that, uh, with the globalization. So I think that's the, the main uh, value of this project, to have a, a contemporary uh, uh, tool to compete with that in order to preserve our uh, intangible heritage. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I also touch here on the next slide on the famous Moais. Uh, Moais are not just stone sculptures. 
Um, and this one actually in the picture is 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 an interesting case because actually it's the Moai that um, we have at the British Museum here. So um, the thing with Moais is that they embody the, the souls of the ancestors and contain what they call the, the mana or the wisdom uh, of the essence of the people. Um, and, and, and this uh, uh, documentary, The Spirits of Ancestors, talk about the Rapa Nui uh, quest for recovering the Moais taken by different museums around the globe. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a documentary um, by uh, the director Leonardo Bacalati, and also I know that Mario is very much involved into recovering this tangible heritage. Is that is that right, Mario? Yeah, that, that's a, a, a hot spot of, of the whole issue for us as a community because um, it's the conception we have, we give to the to the Moais in this case, to the statues, that makes the difference between them in all the other representations of uh, the Rapa Nui aircraft, traditional aircraft. Because of this, this, uh, this liminal space, we consider the Moai a living ancestor the, related to this mana, to this uh, vital energy. It, it is the base of our culture. And currently, I am working with the British Museum in, in a project with the community to, to help grant the access. It's not an easy, it's not an easy task, of course, but it's, uh, I, I, I like to think on this as uh, we are paving, paving the road for the new generations. And in, in the case of, of, of the game, uh, I think the same, particularly the language. The language is something that is very important. It carries all the memories, all the information to access to this whole conception of the culture. But uh, obviously we, we are in danger because of all the globalization, all the foreign country, uh, languages also, all the influence. But, uh, well, in my case, I practice the language in, in, among my family, um, in my work, mm -hmm. but uh, it's the words are on the new generations. They are all bombed by the inputs of different languages, different data from everywhere in the world. And I think uh, if we can manage to to improve better better ways to to keep the language, the language will will give us access to the values underneath that are the key for understanding the culture, to making the difference between a piece of art and a piece of a soul of community, as it happens with the, this Moai in the case of the British Museum. Perfect. So yeah, just talking about uh, intangible heritage as well, um, the agriculturalization and linguistic assimilation that follow, um, the annexation of the island by the Chilean state, uh, following like acceleration uh, loss of uh, the cultural and, and language. So the use of the native language was discouraged at the time and in many cases prohibited. And nowadays only 10% of the young population are able to actually speak the language, which a large gap between younger people and older generations. Um, so yeah, this I, I, I put in this slide um, um, an ex extract from the anthropologist Aki Magihara. Uh, which I think gives an eloquent evidence of how important the recovery and preservation of the language, which is what Mario was um, indicating, is for the community. Uh, so this is a kindergarten song. Uh, in the lyrics, the children pledge um, for help in taking care of the voice with uh, love, love and respect. The language then is sort of inseparable from uh, the way of living, uh, thoughts, feelings, um, and, and, and if the language in the community disappears, it's a whole, like the whole social and, and cultural foundation is, is put at risk. So yeah, I found that this very eloquent. So at, in, with this context, um, I was approached by Hahabe Tuki. Um, she's a teacher and community leader, um, and she was very concerned about the current lack of interest from children about language and culture. Uh, she was worrying um, and, and she commented that the children don't know anything, for example, about Aku Aku, which I, I guess is like a, it's about the spirit, right, Mario? Um, they are losing their mana, she said, 
However, they are really into video games. So can we can we actually use those technologies to uh, bring those those things uh, for them to help preserve also recovery the language? Um, for the researcher and artist uh, and game developer Elizabeth Lapense, games uh, can be a powerful means for self-expression for indigenous communities. However, they need to be done right in a way. So this one this was one of the premises of the project. Uh, we wanted to communicate cultural meanings through the game, but also empowering Rapanui people to use this medium as a mean for self-expression. Um, the key to achieve these goals was like to, I think we, we, we thought that the key was to implement um, effective participatory design methods. And um, this is what we did. Um, so we, the, the process was a bit chaotic because we have like multiple teams working at different times, but um, we follow this design thinking sort of approach, uh, beginning with uh, trying to understand the design context and the community expectations through interviews, mostly conducted by uh, students from uh, a major in anthropology and design from Chile. Uh, next, we started, uh, we did a participatory design workshops with children from Rapa Nui, and this information then was distilled uh, into our first digital prototype, which actually was something developed by students from Salford University in, in Manchester. So uh, this is the group working on the qualitative interviews um, for students working with, and she inter they interview our Rapa Nui uh, teachers, uh, also young, young Rapa Nui people and our wise cultural agents. So this is the coding of the data that we have um, show very interesting findings along um, two main themes. Uh, the concerns about changes was one of the themes uh, in, in the island and, and the topics of, uh, emerging from culture and identity. Uh, something to um, look, it was, I, I thought was very interesting was this intersection between nature and culture, which um, there were two aspects that actually were hand by hand. So how do you see that Mario? Like nature, culture, like is those things that actually you tend to separate, but actually from the conversations with uh, Rapa Nui people, actually that you cannot really separate uh, environmental concerns, for example, from uh, their culture and their beliefs. Is that right? Hello? Are you there? Like Maria Abad is not here, but um, um, uh, we can we can uh, take this uh, topic afterwards. So um, moving into the participatory workshop, um, we work with children. Uh, this was during COVID time, so actually we have to work on the distance. And we asked them to draw and play, so we use paper prototype. Um, and the main things that we asked them to explore were places, characters, and myths and stories. Like, and from there we started like. Uh, collecting their ideas for making this game. So uh, we collected very interesting results. Uh, the, the, the maps, uh, especially from the island, were beautiful and very intriguing. And they gave us a glimpse, not just about the uh, geographical place, but also a symbolic understanding of the island and also the perception in the global context. So for example, that drawing shows um, a theme in which uh, we have the buenos, which is like the goodies, and the malos, which is the baddies, which sort of like uh, represents like the, the, the aggression to external threats uh, in the island, as well as characters such as Aku Aku, which is a bad spirit, uh, were also uh, discussed in the stories. So uh, most importantly, they also defined uh, design opportunities, which are elements that raised from conversations in which we could use for as guidelines for design and development. Uh, the first was uh, finding cultural elements present and recognizable to children as the basis for the introduction of new cultural knowledge. Secondly, uh, to avoid sort of the folklorization of the European new culture, looking at the past, but also uh, to the present, uh, which is something that we can illustrate by this, putting um, alongside the petroglyphs, which are ancient with, from the past, with the modern day cultural expressions, such as the graffiti that abound in the island. And finally, the concerns about environmental degradation and impact from uh, climate change rise of as, a, as an, uh, an important topic. I was super lucky at the time to find a group of enthusiastic final year game students to actually put a prototype uh, in, in, 
engaging with the community, engaging with all this information, and started working on a prototype. They formed this story of Honu, and they uh, work with a lot of uh, professionalism. And um, I'm sorry, we have this thing. Um, they named the game Tepito de Canja, this version, uh, of a little piece of land, and is a, a 2D puzzle with mechanics and core play, gameplay. The games follow the journey of a modern day Rapa Nume child, recreating the myth of Tangata Mamo, which is the Birdman, uh, encountering characters, collecting and solving puzzles, right? Um, so I, I have here a trailer to show you. So, yeah, translating the, I've talked about places, translating the island nice game into a game form uh, was a very interesting process. Um, in a way, we can understand that as an overlapping of several layers, like the, the geography layer, but also um, the, the symbolic layer, uh, which uh, came from all these meanings extracted from children's drawings in the place. And all these then um, look how to put or represent that in, in gameplay. Um, and all, all these elements like in, in this form of a, a 2D scrolling game. Now, something interesting as well from, from the team was uh, understanding also the landscape, understanding the modern constructions. They, they, they did everything based on, on photographic references from, from the island. Uh, also the characters. Um, the, on the side of development, they, they, they took one of the, the children's drawings and they, they developed uh, this uh, child, uh, the child character, but also they um, worked on how to represent uh, spirits like Aku Aku or Vai Aheva. Um, and, and finally, the myths. So the, the main narrative axis of the game is centered on this myth of Tangata Manu or the Burman, which is um, um, widespread in the island and, and commonly found in multiple modern and past representations, like those petroglyphs. The Kangaka Manu was um, the winner of an old and highly sort of important competition that was performed every year in the island. Um, each year they chose uh, warriors or of each tribe that would descend the sheer cliff of uh, Ranukau, swim offshore to a small uh, rocky sled of Motunui, and then retrieve the egg of um, of, of the bird, right? After all this, the, the winner have to swim back, scale the cliffs again, and present the unbroken egg to their tribal chief as a present. The chief was received the egg will be then to the, the one who will be ruling Easter Island until the next ceremony. So, um, Mario, are you there? Hello? So yeah, but, but basically this, uh, in terms of gameplay, it's already a game, so uh, it was it wasn't difficult to actually put this as a main narrative because it, in 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 a way it it forms already like what what we could uh, use as as gameplay. And the other side that also we were very interesting was uh, or or sort of secondary quest, uh, in which uh, in this one we use the sea turtle, uh, which is also one of the foundational myths from the island. So there's a lot of mythological stories that refer to sea turtles as uh, guides in the ocean um, from the land of Otumatua and the origin of the Rapa Nui people. So um, yeah, that concludes the presentation. And 
Thank you very much. How can I? Thank you. Um, one second here, let me start my video. Um, thank you to all three of you for your time. Uh, both uh, very uh, fascinating projects and there were a lot of comments as you'll note in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, so, but I, I wanted to dive right into the questions here and uh, get your thoughts on some of these questions. I'll start with the first one in the Q&A box here. Um, uh, somebody is asking, I caught a glimpse of a Coca-Cola sign in the native language trailer. Is Coca-Cola an integral part of the island's culture? <laughs> um, that's a question for Mario. <laughs> Yeah, Mario, I'm coming, you... coming right the way. Well, if we consider uh, the contemporary culture, yes, of course. And I want to to express that uh, more. We are about seven thousand people in the world, left from this uh, hundred and eleven people after the slave raids and uh, is so so sad and so terrible history. But uh, what I want to share is that uh, at least in my generation, I'm 36, uh, we we are not weeping and crying on that on our terrible history because in that way we become victims and we are always trying to mend something that is not going to come back. So in in a way to survive, we take uh, the culture as it is today. We always honor the ancestral culture. We are vehicles of that. We are trying to preserve as much as we can, especially on our elders. But we cannot deny the life we are living today. We cannot deny and deny this because it is a fact. The people, the Japanese people today, drinks Coca Cola. The the propaganda and everything is out there in the streets but it's when you reach that that uh, that barrier the contemporary barrier that you you can find in any any place in the world right now is when you start to dig under the the root of the culture and in that term if you don't manage the the language you only have a you know, you, you only have a portrait of it, but you cannot go deeper. And I think the objective of this project, especially to become a, a tool for kids, for children, to be more interested in their culture. I, I won't put it in the way that uh, the kids have no interest. The Rapa Nui, uh, our identity is very strong for as uh, Juan said, uh, the myth of the Burman, of the Tangatamanu, for us, is, it is not a myth. It's part of our history. It's part of our identity. But in my position of a 30, 36 guy, and in the position of uh, being taught by elder people, I know this information, this, this base needs to be enhanced, needs to be... Uh, nurtured by more and more uh, specialized information by the other people and the, the knowledge holders. But to get there, you have to, to cross a long way of uh, understanding the language, understanding the values, the culture. And this project, I think it can help on, on that starting, on that uh, beginning, catching the, the attention of the, of the children's to go deeper and then we can do our part as a as a living culture to improve the their knowledge and their understanding but yes we are in a in a globalized town in Rapa Nui we are 7000 people but uh, we live same life more or less but more more in contact with the nature we have the sea one kilometer from our, our office. We have all this mixed up in this small town. So I think it's uh, it's quite a good thing to, to show it that way. 
that is the way it is, not to folklorize the culture. We mm. are not living in loin clothes as our ancestors, but we still keeping this this importance and putting the importance into that into preserving. Thank you for asking all of this. Great. Yeah, it's great to hear that perspective, Mario. Um, I uh, I had some more questions pop up, actually, in response to what you were saying, I think. And um, uh, and this is also a question for James, too, um, about the uh, development of empathy through playing the games. How, uh, you know, typically it's very hard to empathize with cultures or groups that are different from you. But do you feel that the games have... Um, have affected change in that way in terms of empathizing with with groups? Um, I, I can start and talk a little bit about ours. I mean, I, I think uh, that it definitely has had uh, some of that effect. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that games have is that they allow, because of the interaction, they allow you to literally, you know, in some ways, put yourself in the role of, of a different person. And that can be very powerful for people kind of uh, imagining. Um, I should also say, you know, in game study circles, there's been a little bit of a, a, a critique of that idea, where as you know, people don't want it to feel like, uh, I don't know, if you have a, a game about somebody, you know, going going through the desert and almost starving, and you play that, like you have not ex experienced the ex uh, what it's like to go through the desert and almost starve. Um, so there, there is a limit to that, and I think it's good for us to kind of uh, be aware of that um, tension. Uh, but I also just think that, you know, uh, especially um, when we're talking about a 3D environment, there's just a way to give kind of cues of presentation and senses of space um, in a way that you don't get um, even from watching like a high production film because you get to choose where to look and choose where to spend time and go. And even just those kind of simple things, I think, kind of orient people's minds um, and, and, and get them thinking. So, yeah, I think that there are both um, uh, affordances in games that allow you to kind of push their potential for empathy. Um, but there's also things that we need to be careful with. Um, you know, like if you have, um, there's one more example, like, uh, if you were, uh, watching a movie about some kind of, uh, horrible graphic tragedy, watching the movie, you might feel like you are like a sober witness to something that's very serious. Uh, but if there's a game about that exact same thing and you either have to perpetrate that or endure that, then that may now feel like it's in bad taste because it's kind of trivializing that somehow. So I think that all of these different mediums have um, different advantages. And by knowing the medium, you can kind of uh, use it to, to generate the most uh, uh, effective reactions. Great. And, and for Juan and Mario, uh, do you think that uh, the game has helped with empathy um, or at least an under a better understanding of the culture? I, I can take the one, that one, <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, what, what I've, I have found from uh, especially testing sessions is that the relationship that players have within the game is very complex. So they are playing and switching between multiple sort of identities there. Um, the identities, for example, you are playing with your own identity, your personal identity, but also you have the identity of the avatar. And in also you, you, you are, uh, of course, playing a game, so you are a player. So all those switching between multiple identities are sort of happens all the time. And what we, are, we, we, we have found is that, especially when kids concentrate um, too much on the, the, the player identity, so I want to win the game, for example, and that's what I want to do. Then uh, they 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 don't really become attached to the narrative side of the game. Mm -hmm. They don't empathize so much it's because what they want to do is to to win the game. Um, whereas when you have these children that uh, assume or are more close uh, close distance with the avatar stories um, and with their, their own values, is that's when actually we we're going to start playing with this um, um, sort of the game becomes like an, an instrument for raising empathy about particular situations. So that I think that games could, can be a very powerful tool for our empathy, but of course it's a very subjective experience and also depends how the game is constructed. Yeah, great, uh, both really nuanced uh, points. Um, and I noticed that Mario answered a question that came in, um, I might sort of mention it for the other panelists here. Um, 
uh, Christine is asking, what advice uh, do you have for members of marginalized communities uh, for more uh, representation? You know, we're a historic preservation group here, so she's mentioning historic preservation, but in general, sort of in historical interpretation, how do you, uh, what do you recommend to involve these communities uh, beyond these games um, in these efforts, you know, and any, any advice on your part, uh, what you've learned in your efforts? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we don't hear Mario even though it says he's unmuted. Now? Yes, now we hear you. Okay. Well, as I tried to, to give a synthesized answer to her, uh, if we put ourselves in a perspective of being ma marginalized, we are putting this this power into some someone else. And with this, I am not trying to erase the past history, but I'm trying to make a, a stance in our present history. As I answered to, to her, be part of it. Even if you are not uh, able to do it, try always to push someone to, to have some voices from the community there in the whole process because the creative part is one the beginning of it you there is a big responsibility is the way i act in 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 this kind of initiatives to have this uh quality selection of the information of of everything always as a suggestive because we work with a lot of people we don't really know and respect is overall but uh this is something that is going going to impact you and your community straight away and this is a responsibility needs to be achieved and addressed by ourselves we cannot always as a community marginalized community and acknowledging that we cannot always uh, relate to someone else to blame someone else we have to be part of it we have to be grateful of all the skills all the intentions all the the energy that is put in these kind of initiatives this or any other, but we we have this uh, responsibility to be there, to be part of it, uh, because in that way, in my point of view, we we can grant some some little of real of of real. I mean, it's to be uh, not to be eloquent, it's to be real about it, because uh, as I said, if a, if a person that is programming the, the the, the game or researching previously and it is saying as a myth from the perspective of the researcher we can jump in and say no we, we don't consider this a myth for us this is our history it's not just written in paper it's written in the rocks and now it is written in this media so that's my, my best ad advice if if it's not you try always to help the community to be involved, but to be part in the discussion, in the creation, in the decisions, in 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 everything. Thank you very much, and we're uh, out of time here. Um, but thank you, all, all three of you, for your time today. And James, I think um, there were some questions there that I could probably quickly answer to. Is um, can I play the Black Haven game on the website if I create a login? I think all they would need to do is visit the Steam page and as long as they have a pc um they can play the game yeah right? you, have, you have to have a a gaming pc to blackhaven but i'm going to put this in the chat i do have a, a youtube playthrough of it um so it's a, a pretty linear story so if anyone would like to experience it and they're not a game person they're welcome to uh watch that video great thanks for sharing that um and juan uh is your is the game available that you worked on or uh the game um, is not available. Uh, it was um, our first prototype. So we are moving now. Actually, we, we're getting funding for the next prototype. So um, yeah, you have to wait a little bit more, but it will be available soon, I promise. Great. Yeah, we'll be sure to share it once we hear hear from you about it. Um, so uh, well, thank you all three again, and uh, wonderful presentations. Um, we did make a recording and uh, we'll jump right into the annual meeting right now. So feel free to jump off if you need to, uh, but um, I'm gonna turn it over to 
our executive director, and she's going to kick us off for the program for the uh, annual meeting. Well, thank you, thank John. You. I'm actually, thank you everyone for speaking. This was fascinating. I really, truly enjoyed every, every word you said. It was very interesting. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm going to invite Adrian and our, um, yeah, there you are, Adrian. Adrian's actually going to open up the meeting. So, Adrian, take it away. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, thank you, John and Cindy and everybody that's part of our education committee for putting together this program and Mario and the other speakers. I mean, it was really interesting in terms of thinking about both tangible and tangible heritage. And I like what you said, Mario, in terms of be real about it. I think that is uh, good advice in terms of what we're trying to do in historic preservation, but also encouraging and being able to share uh, cultures and stories and both, you know, the, the broad story. So again, thank you. It's a really great program. Um, I have the great pleasure of serving, currently serving as the president of the Board of Trustees for the California Preservation Foundation. And this is our annual opportunity to have our annual membership meeting. So I get the pleasure of picking this off. Uh, it's our opportunity for CPF to share a little bit about what we've been doing for the last year. So you'll know a little bit more about what we're up to, some of the efforts that we do statewide to ensure that the broad cultural architectural heritage of California is being preserved, conserved, and honored. And so, um, again, welcome everybody to this. We'll have a brief meeting. Um, we have a few things we need to do in terms of action today. Um, the first point of action is to approve our minutes from our June 9th, 2022 annual membership meeting. So it's been a while. Uh, so I don't expect you all to remember those, but if you could, uh, you have a poll that just popped up in terms of asking you to approve those minutes. So all those in favor, please hit the yes uh, in terms of the poll that came up. And if anyone uh, does not, uh, feel free to hit the no. John, let, John or Cindy, please let me know if it's okay. Go ahead. I guess it is. Uh, looks like we've got 100% of those that voted in approval of the minutes. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, and at this time, I'd like to formally introduce uh, our mighty but small staff of the California Preservation Foundation to share a little bit about what they've been working on. Um, so Cindy Heisman, our executive director, and John Haber, our field services director who do so much for this organization. Thank you to both of you and uh, please take it away. Thanks, Adrian. Um, it is such a pleasure to work with you. I, I'm gonna miss you. Um, you'll be nearby, I know, but yeah, I just wanna give a shout out to you. What a, what a dynamic um, president and leader of this organization you've been. Um, I wanna thank all of our speakers today. Again, it, it was a wonderful presentation and thank everyone who's attended and who's attending this meeting. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging my support or acknowledging the support and the uh, many contributions of CPF staff uh, over the past year and CPF's board. It was my great pleasure to work with such a smart, dedicated staff, John Haber, and until October, Christine Madrid French. Um, the staff and the board are two parts of the whole that delivers CPF's mission. Um, board elections are normally part of our um, annual meeting. Um, however, this year, our board election will be held by electronic vote. This was approved by our board as required in our bylaws. So members will receive information on the election by email in early um, July. And uh, though we may, we address many diverse issues throughout the year, um, our report will focus on our past fiscal year from October 1, 2021 through September of 2022. Um, our work is really divided into two major buckets, but we have other things naturally that we do um, on advocacy. It's advocacy and education. Um, in advocacy, we uh, are continuing our focus on policy at the state level, and uh, we continue to monitor bills, impact historic resources across California. Um, 
we've met with legislative staff and state agency staff uh, to usher in the implementation of the new California Historic Tax Credit passed by legislature in 2019. This is still an ongoing process. The passage of the bill was only the first step. And before any tax credits can be allocated, the rules for administering the uh, California Historic Tax Tax Credit must be developed by two state agencies. That's the State Office of Historic Preservation and the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee. The draft rules had not been released as of, as of the end of September 2022. However, um, they have since been released for comment and uh, that comment period closed about two weeks ago. Uh, the California Tax Credit Allocation uh, Committee um, first release their rules and had to retract them. And I don't believe that they've released them, but when they do, we'll let our members know. Um, so we're still waiting and the target um, date for um, making tax credit applications available is the end of 2023. Um, despite this, we've held webinars on the components and the features of the California Historic Tax Credit and other high profile state and federal initiatives, including federal tax credit program enhancements, and um, we've lobbied for increased funding for the Federal Historic Preservation Fund, which supports the implementation of federal programs within state and tribal preservation offices. Um, part of our advocacy through education program um, this year included a two-part webinar on economic incentives for historic preservation targeting the five county region in the far north part of California um, it's part of the service area um, supported by the McConnell Foundation in Reading. And we were really pleased to do that. That was through direct outreach from them to us to provide that programming. Um, other activities that aligned with our strategic plan included our plan giving program that, that was um, the initial phase of that was completed. Um, we've also implemented a new calendar for the um, California Preservation Awards, where uh, we held two awards this fiscal year. And last year we held it online and we're now moving back into in-person um, events. Um, and our annual conference was planned um, last year. It was online, but this year or during the last latter part of last fiscal year, we're planning our um, in-person event at Fort Mason. Um, membership, as of the end of September 2022, um, we saw that we had 1,104 members, and 238 of those memberships were free memberships. Um, as a reminder to our members, we offer free memberships for students as part of our program to support students who are studying historic preservation programs, um, which also includes scholarships that are funded by um, donations from Liz Gordon at Liz Antique Hardware. Um, the membership numbers do reflect an increase in membership over the previous year. And if we invite everyone who is watching, who is not a member to join CPF. It's important that we have membership support for our lobbying efforts. And it just supports the work that we do like the webinar that you watched today that was free. Um, looking forward, we will continue our work to influence state policy regarding the protection of historic resources. We're going to expand our reach throughout California and build partnerships um, through our programs, um, especially Doors Open California. It's a great vehicle for doing that. John Haber will give you more of an update on that. And we're going to focus on increasing and diversifying our funding sources, including um, increasing membership and individual giving. And we look to expand our work um, to provide accessible, informative programs through online programs like you just watched, through our conference, and again, through our newest program, um, Doors Open California. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to John Haber who can talk about um, what's happening in education. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I had the wonderful benefit of uh, working with Christine Majid French on this series of programs um, last fiscal year. And we did a lot of really creative um, and exciting uh, programs that kind of pushed the envelope uh, in term, uh, both in terms of what we've done before, but also in general, uh, the historic preservation field uh, for educational programming. Um, 
we we uh, continued our uh, awards series of programs that preceded the actual awards celebrations that were, as Cindy mentioned, in person uh, this past fiscal year. Um, and um, three of those programs were one was on movie magic, one was on two cities, two approaches, which included the South Pasadena design guidelines and the San Francisco resiliency plan. Um, and then finally, one on hotel, it was entitled Hotel California that looked at uh, rehab of historic hotels. So that was a nice series of programs. And, and I'll sort of describe the, the whole range of programs. I won't read them all because we did over, um, it appears to be over uh, 30 programs last year. So I won't go through them all, but some of the highlights were um, we did a series on modernism entitled Mahalo to Mo Modernism. It looked at the Hawaii uh, pathbreaking modernist context statement. We did uh, some programs, uh, a boot camp for, uh, for planners and commissioners, and we'll continue doing boot camps. We feel that uh, the uh, important training uh, for commissioners and planners especially needs to be an ongoing thing, as has been in the past with us. We, uh, we feel that our education programs spread the benefits of historic preservation uh by by you know by by learning people are able to share that knowledge with others and that's uh, been our experience um and then we we did a fun series of programs in the holidays uh of 2021 it was a four-part series that year um and uh the the parts were entitled playing places sacred spaces let's hit the slopes and gingerbread builder all of which looked at historic spaces in a playful and fun manner uh, and we'll continue to do our holiday programs. What we've seen is that um, there's a lot more engagement in the holidays when we do uh, topics like this. And also um, it's tied into our annual auction. So we've been, as many of you may know, we've been doing an annual auction for the past three years, I believe. Um, we also did a number of book clubs, one on Paul Williams but, uh, with photographs by Jana Ireland. We did a book club on Living the California Dream, which was the book uh, written uh, on African American leisure sites during the Jim Crow era, we um, we looked uh, at some context statement training. We did a a, a program with George Smart of U.S. Modernist um, and uh, L.A.'s legendary restaurants with George Geary, um, and also a, a very well attended uh, program on Julia Morgan, uh, which was our highest uh, attendance for the year in terms of a distinct webinar, which uh, brought in about 435 participants just through Zoom. Um, and as many of you know, we, we also could continue to offer these free programs. And we, uh, we, ha we, we need the support of members and donors to continue to offer these free programs, but we fully intend on continuing to offer them. So we would appreciate any uh, continued support you can offer for them. Last year, in terms of revenue for our educational programs, we were uh, a bit over uh, $19,000 in registration revenue and then another $5,000 in donation revenue uh, tied directly to, um, to programs. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll sort of close with, um, Cindy mentioned we did some partnerships. We also did a program entitled Home Safe Home in partnership uh, through a, a grant offered uh, uh, by by FEMA and uh, through a partnership with the Office of Historic Preservation, Page and Turnbull, Mel Green, and Structural Focus. Um, and that program is still available for free online. It's a five part series um, and you'll find it by searching Home Safe Home online. Um, we also uh, pushed forward with our underrepresented California program. We set up an online page for applications and uh, pleased to announce that we'll be making moves on that soon and uh, pretty soon we'll be getting um, a site nominated to a local register. Uh, with, with that, I uh, want to close with um, a very basic summary of our feedback. Um, for, the, for the year, we had an average feedback of 4.8 out of 5, uh, which was an increase from the previous year of 0. Point, uh, a very slight increase, 0. 0.01 from the previous year. But uh, our programs continue to get reviewed very well. And one of the comments, just from a qualitative standpoint, uh, somebody mentioned addressing the economic benefits of historic preservation is something that is too often overlooked when speaking about or promoting historic preservation. And it is one of the most important things to address. This program did a wonderful job and kudos to CPF. So we do continue to collect feedback on all our programs and we encourage you if you attend one to let us know how we did so we can make improvements. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Cindy, I think, and uh, we'll continue the rest of the meeting.
Yeah, and um, actually we're going to invite Mike Gibson up to give the financial report. Morning, everyone. Uh, as is customary, the report at this annual meeting is for our most recently completed fiscal year. As Cindy mentioned, our 2021-2022 fiscal year began on October 1st, 2021, and ended on September 30th, 2022. Our financial activity during that year was very similar to the prior fiscal year, 2020-2021. Uh, the bottom line is that we ended the year in the black with a surplus of about $59,000. So first taking a quick look at our balance sheet as of the end of the fiscal year, our assets, which were valued at $484,000, were up 5% over the prior fiscal year. Our liabilities, which totaled $81,000, were down 26% as compared to the prior year. And our net worth, which was $403,000, was up 15% over the prior year. Uh, the key reason for that increase in our net worth was that the Paycheck Protection Program loans, the PPP loans, which we received of $50,500, were forgiven and converted into unrestricted assets during the course of the fiscal year. So next, taking a quick look at our income statement for the fiscal year. Support, which totaled $377,000, was down only about 2% as compared to the prior fiscal year. So basically our contributions and sponsorships held steady throughout the year. Our earned revenue, which totaled $143,000, was up 11% over the prior year. Uh, we saw a 30% decrease in online conference registration fees, but that was more than offset by the unanticipated tour income we received as a result of our first ever Doors Open event. Also, our membership dues were up 12% uh, over the prior fiscal year. Uh, our expenses, which totaled $461,000, were up 5% compared to the prior year. We saw expense increases in health and workers' compensation insurance, compensation for consultants, such as our lobbyists and our graphic artists, uh, IT expenses, postage and delivery expenses, and finally, student scholarships. Uh, we also paid during the fiscal year some deferred employee bonuses that have been authorized in early 2020. So as previously mentioned, our net income for the year, which was $59,000, was slightly down from 21, uh, about 21% 21 from the prior year. So finally, comparing our performance during the year with our budget for the year, uh, for support, we achieved 90% of the budgeted amount. For earned revenue, we achieved 109% of the budgeted amount. Good news on both fronts. Our expenses, we spent 98% of the budgeted amount, so just about even with our budget. And our net income, we achieved 76% of the budgeted amount. And although we didn't quite achieve our projected goal for net income, as previously noted, we did end the year in the back, in the black with that surplus of about $59,000. So that's the 2021-2022 fiscal year in a nutshell. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to review the actual financial reports, please feel free to contact me. And probably the easiest way to do that would be to uh, uh, send an email to Cindy, and then she will put you in touch with me. Okay, thank you very much. I think we need to take action on adopting the financial report. Is that correct, Cindy? Yes. So if you could uh, in the poll again. While you're doing that, I just want to thank Mike. Uh, for being our numbers guy. Uh, the treasurer is like a thankless job, so we need to thank him um, for doing this. And again, uh, those that voted 100% uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, well, I have been asked to uh, 
put together an in-depth presentation on the history of uh, Adrian's leadership. I'm just joking, Adrian. I apologize. There's no presentation, but um, in all seriousness, you know, we'd like to take this brief moment to share our gratitude uh, for the leadership that you've provided over the past six years as a CPF trustee. Your leadership in advocacy has set the bar extremely high. I personally have been involved. I have not personally been involved uh, with advocacy as an engineer, I, working with materials and structures, but I've learned a tremendous amount from your leadership in this realm of historical, cultural uh, heritage and preservation. And you know, this guidance has been invaluable for me and the board and you know, over the past two years, uh, your leadership as president of the Board of Trustees has been exceptional. Uh, the past 12 months, uh, working alongside Cindy, John, and others as CPF introduced their inaugural Doors Open California event, uh, Adrian led the board in raising awareness and support for the event, and this has helped set the groundwork for the second annual program coming up later this year. So stay tuned, everyone. And, you know, most recently in April, Adrian, you presided over the annual conference held at the Fort Mason Center for the Arts and Culture in San Francisco. This was our first in-person conference since the beginning of the pandemic. And it was a wonderful achievement. Uh, there's, uh, It was great to see everyone and uh, the both in-person and hybrid events were just a resounding success. And, you know, it's evident that uh, your leadership over the last six years has charted a clear and very exciting path for the CPF board and for Cindy and John and the greater membership. And uh, the years to come are looking very bright. And so thank you very much, Adrian. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and thanks to the fellow board of trustees and members. It's been a pleasure serving with you all. Um, if you haven't gleaned uh, yet, I'm leaving. Uh, my term is up. It's time for me to go. And uh, there's plenty of good people to do great work ahead, including Jeff um, and other members of the board and the staff. I just want to thank everybody. It's been a pleasure working with you. I really believe in CPF as a statewide preservation organization. We have lots of great groups across the state doing work. Um, at the local level and in our local governments, but we need a statewide organization uh, to advocate on behalf of preservation, especially with a very active legislature um, and to achieve things like the state tax credit, which we're almost there. Thank you, Cindy, for being diligent and persistent and the state office of historic preservation for uh, making that happen. But and again, it's been a pleasure and I will stay involved in Abbotsky if you will have me and uh, look forward to continuing to support the organization as uh, things move on. So um, I think it's my last official duty uh, is a really important one. Um, unless there's any discussion, uh, we just need to vote to adjourn. So I think there's one more poll that if John, if you're able to bring up. Oh, yeah, one second. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I was off screen here. So let me uh, get that pulled up here momentarily adjourn no no oh not, not adjourn. Very good. yeah <laughs> so hopefully everyone's in the yes category um uh conclude our annual membership meeting and again uh thank you all thank you adrian thank you adrian absolutely see you later bye-bye